Hi everyone, I'm Shiran from Battery Ventures, and we're very excited to have you join us to discuss some of the big things happening in fintech over the next few sessions. While meeting entrepreneurs, we often get asked questions like, what's happening as software companies offer financial services and financials offer workflow? What can fintechs do to ensure their products don't get commoditized? And most of all, how should different types of fintechs be valued? To kick off the day, let's dive into some of these and more. Just before, though, I want to start by thanking the real superheroes who made this all possible. Our speakers, all of whom have very busy schedules and still made the time to be here, Aaron and Lior from Battery for their deep research on this presentation, Alicia and Alex from our marketing team, and the whole Barclays events team who led coordination of the event and without which we wouldn't be here today. I also want to share with you a heartfelt note from our legal team that these views are our own. And to set some context, a little about us. I work at Battery Ventures, which is a global venture capital fund investing cross-stage in the US, Europe, and Israel. We've been investing in technology companies since 1983 and are currently investing funds representing 2.4 billion of fresh capital. Over the years, we've had the opportunity to partner with entrepreneurs from over 450 companies, where over half of those have been software companies and have gotten involved at all company stages from seed to mature. These experiences have given us a deep perspective on the challenges you face as entrepreneurs, as well as some learnings which I look forward to sharing with you. In addition to software companies, we've been backing financial services companies since 1985 when we made our first investment in the space in a company called HNC Software. HNC ultimately merged with FICO to help them provide credit decisioning solutions and is representative of the first of several waves of financial innovation in a category we call picks and shovel software, where software is sold to financial services companies to help them run their business. The next big wave we experienced began in the late 90s with companies acting as middlemen and facilitating financial services transactions. These were significant in that they touched the money and included regulated exchanges like the London International Financial Futures Exchange, as well as more recent investments in the likes of Coinbase. From middlemen, we started seeing a wave of companies we term the house that moved to actually take on risk and compete with incumbent financial services companies head on in their core products. And today, the biggest trend we're seeing is the rise of embedded finance where rather than the buyer going to the financial services provider for a product, these offerings are moving to find the buyer and embedding themselves in external software. To understand the backdrop for embedded finance, if we look at public software and financial companies, we see that the line between the two is starting to blur. A new category of companies is emerging at the intersection, with some software companies offering financial services and some financial companies including software and workflow features. The combination of software and financial services has created some very compelling companies which investors are taking notice of. To demonstrate the point, if we look at a universe of the top 100 software companies on the left, we see that these companies tend to trade at an EV sales multiple of about 11 times. On the right, traditional financial services are typically valued off a more conservative metric of after-tax net earnings or even book value, a point I'll revisit later. But interestingly, this emerging category of companies in the middle, which rely on both software and financial revenue streams, are receiving nearly twice the revenue multiple of traditional software companies. So as many of us in the audience work to build the fintech platforms of the future, we asked ourselves, what can these two categories teach us as fintech innovators? Let's start off with software. I'm going to cover three lessons learned from Battery's 38 years of software investing experience. While many of us in the audience come from fintech, we strongly believe that as tech investors increasingly look at fintech and software as a benchmark on tech in general, it's important to understand how they might think about your business. And for our first lesson, I want to talk to you about the role your product takes with your customer. One of the things software companies have figured out is that the more embedded you are in your customers' people and processes, the harder you are to replace. And if you look at the top 50 software companies by market cap, you can place them on a continuum between fulfilling a function, which might be necessary, but is still utility at the end of the day, through being systems of engagement that users are constantly interacting with, and up to systems of record, which hold the data that represents the source of truth for organizations in a given process. If we do this, you'll note, with a few exceptions, that many of the younger companies provide a certain best-of-breed tool, but the ones that really stuck around own their business process, and as a result, have been much harder to replace. I think there's a learning here for fintech. If you think about legacy financial institutions, like insurance companies or the bank you work with, 
No one really tries to interact with them, and their customers treat them more like necessary utilities. But something we're seeing in very successful fintechs is that they manage to move from being utilities to being systems that drive engagement. So ask yourself, do you own your business process? We think you should. Another interesting point comes up in go-to-market. Looking at the history of software sales, software used to be sold top-down by enterprise sales reps catering to C-level buyers. This would typically involve long sales cycles and expensive sales and marketing organizations. More recently, however, some of the newer and faster-growing software companies have relied on bottoms-up, product-led growth. Rather than relying on a single large sale requiring executive buy-in, PLG companies build excellent products which cater to their end users first. These products often can be purchased with a credit card by a user and reimbursed, making the barrier to purchase much lower. As a result, these companies have experienced substantially higher growth with greater efficiency through lower sales and marketing costs and quicker payback periods. We think there's a lesson to be learned here for FinTech as well. Finally, the latest trend reinforcing successful product-led growth playbooks is a strong and vibrant community built around the product. If we think about the evolution of software sales, early enterprise software saw companies like IBM and Oracle relying on a sales-driven organization enabled by CRM. In the 2000s, we saw marketing automation players enabling software organizations to lead with marketing and deepen their funnels, greatly augmenting the sales effort. As on our last lesson, from 2015 onwards, we started seeing the rise of product-led growth. These companies iterate aggressively on features, learning what customers use most, and running tests to optimize engagement. But more recently, we're seeing that this product-led motion can be greatly amplified through community. We believe that community can be the marketing to product sales, we're fostering knowledge transfer and collaboration on a product using Slack channels, virtual conferences like this one, and other tools can come back and greatly amplify a product-driven sales motion, which we're not really seeing in FinTech just yet, but expect to see from some of the best companies in the category. So let's put this all together so that we really understand how these software lessons apply to two real companies, which many of you in the audience might be using. Atlassian on the one hand, and Notion on the other. If we look at the first lesson of owning the business process, development lives within Jira at Atlassian, and Notion is a workspace in which collaboration amongst teams happens. Moving to go-to-market Motion, both companies follow a bottoms-up, product-led approach, where Atlassian offers multiple entry points for teams into its product suite, enabling them to land in an account from amongst a host of different buyers. And Notion receives over 85% of its traffic organically from individual users interested in the product. Finally, both companies host strong and vibrant communities sharing knowledge, setups, and events. Given these attributes, Atlassian and Notion have both grown impressively and command valuations to match. So those were a few thoughts from software companies. But in building a fintech platform, let's now look at what we can learn from financial services companies and go to three lessons that we can learn from them. So just first philosophically, there are obviously some big differences between software and financial companies. Whereas in software, you need to convince the customer that they need your solution to organize around a certain pain point, and you might have to convince a number of stakeholders and compare competing offerings. In the case of financial companies, offering funding or mandatory insurance coverage can at times be an easier sell. However, these businesses come with new challenges, which traditional financial companies have been dealing with for decades. Let's dive into them. For the first, one of the things I've observed, particularly from software companies entering financial services for the first time, is that they have less exposure to the world of capital markets. And just like for any cloud company, where you want resilient and redundant technical infrastructure, it's equally important in offering financial services to have redundancy in your financial supply chain. Taking lending, for example, a pattern we see among successful fintech startups is an intentional diversification of funding sources. So you might start off at seed, lending out your VC equity. It's then quite common to grow that to taking some hedge fund or credit fund money, typically non-bank institutions that know how to invest in a new business model. Most startups will then go to banks and sign up for warehouse facilities, which are usually also bigger and quite a bit cheaper than the non-bank sources, albeit requiring a more structured diligence process to secure. And finally, the holy grail of financial supply chain is typically securitization, where you can gain very material and scalable liquidity at a low cost of capital, but which requires scale and a knowledge of how to access the capital markets. 
So why go through all this effort, especially if your existing relationships are more than happy to upsize your existing sources? One of the things we've seen is that through different macroeconomic cycles, which affect both you and your financial backers, companies that diversify their capital sources are much more likely to stay afloat. So while it's often a substantial time commitment to constantly build your financial supply chain, we think it's a worthwhile investment. Next, I want to challenge a tech saying we all know, move fast and break things. While in software that may work, in regulated industries, it really doesn't. And just in the last few years, we've seen a whole host of companies run into regulatory trouble when they didn't play by the rules. And the thing to remember here is, it's not even about fines, which can be really expensive, but regulators can actually force you to change or even halt your business until you've cleared an issue. And for that reason, if we look at these companies on the right, which have really all the resources in the world, they still chose to work with these financial institutions in launching their financial products. That way, they've ensured compliance and didn't risk running afoul of consumer regulation. Our recommendation? Learn and abide by the rules or find a partner to help you. Then, for our final lesson, one of the questions that I've often been asked is, if money is the ultimate commodity and your customers can purchase the same product from many different competitors, how can you build defensibility? So to answer that question, let's look at two consumer lending companies. See if you can guess who they are. The first was founded in 2006, the other in 2012. Both did, very roughly, around half a billion dollars in revenue last year. The left one is growing a little bit faster than the right. If we then look at how they're valued, the right one actually has a much higher market cap, corresponding to a much higher multiple. Why is that? So these are Lending Club and Affirm, and if we look at it, there are many factors, but one of the big ones is a difference in their distribution strategy. Lending Club needs to acquire each of its borrowers directly, a process which is expensive and can include offline components. A firm, on the other hand, is an example of the embedded finance trend we referred to earlier and sits on a merchant's checkout page, in this case Casper, meaning that they don't need to acquire customers every time, but rather need to focus on being great partners to their merchants. The takeaway from this is that when selling financial products, the how can matter just as much as the what. So putting these all together, here's a checklist of the lessons from software and financial services. One question you can ask yourself is, how many of these do you currently fulfill? And which of them might still be applicable to your business? And from there, let's go to the final and biggest question that we get asked in the space, which is, if you're somewhere between software and financial services, how should your company be valued? So to start off, I get a lot of questions from fintech entrepreneurs asking why they don't always get the same multiples as in subscription SaaS companies. And while there's a lot of nuance here that we'll explore, Let's quickly look at some differences in business model, using a lender as an example of a typical risk-bearing financial services company. So first, on model, SaaS companies typically sell licenses of their tool, whereas the lender would extend credit. One advantage financials have is that growth can be quite rapid. While in choosing a software tool, customers typically need to understand how it works, how they'd use it, and choose from a range of options, in selling money, it really often comes down to the terms. So we often see fintechs that can grow at top line at least as fast or even faster than best-in-class software companies. On the other hand, if you look at the margins and scalability, a software company will keep 60 to 90% of the margins, where in financials, these margins will be weighed down by cost of capital, fraud, and credit losses when some loans aren't repaid, typically leading to lower margins than software. Further, they're constrained by their balance sheet and the amount of product they can extend at any given time a limitation software companies don't have. And as a last point here, if we think about bringing the customer back, most SaaS companies are recurring subscriptions by definition, whereas financials can be anything from a one-time transaction to being highly reoccurring in nature. So the point I'd make here is that when you're selling money, it's easy to grow quickly, but growth isn't the only important metric. If we look at this from a public company point of view, we'll see that this point comes across very clearly. So on the left, this is a regression of public software companies where each dot is a company with an x-axis for growth and a y-axis for their revenue multiple. And what we see is that the faster the company is growing, the higher the multiple they're typically valued at. If we then look at financial services though, the correlation is a bit different. So this is a group of banks and the correlation is between multiple on their book value, which in a sense defines the potential capacity they have to lend out 
and the x-axis is on their profitability. And what we see is that the higher profitability is correlated to a higher multiple, not growth. So then the question is, what happens if you're in between and you have a business model that's one of the many shades between pure software and pure financials? So we took a shot at this and created the Battery FinTech Framework, our BFF, if you will, and decided to classify the various subcategories of FinTech companies based on their revenue model. So here, we can see a group of publicly traded companies with an x-axis with their EV sales multiple and where the y-axis categorizes them by revenue model. And looking at it, what we can see is that the highest valued companies are the ones that take subscription fees and fees on financial products with essentially no balance sheet requirement or risk. And the lowest category is pure lending, which relies on interest income and is heavily balance sheet dependent. Interestingly, in the middle, we can see companies that are in between. For instance, short duration lenders like the buy now, pay later category, which have loans out for a relatively short period of time and receive fees from their merchant partners. As a result, BNPL have been awarded more generous valuations than the pure lenders, but are still trading just shy of the payments category. So as you think about your evolving business model, we think this is a good framework for understanding how you might be valued by tech investors. And you know what? We believe it's only the beginning for fintech. With US financial services representing a market cap of $6.2 trillion, we think there's enormous value creation to be had, starting with the people in this room. We can't wait to work hand in hand with you to conquer this massive opportunity. Welcome to fintech, the end game.